Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Who Can It Be Now podcast. This is Marilyn Aloria, psychic medium, teacher, and coach. And this is the first episode. Wow, I've been listening to so many podcasts, really good ones, and they are kick-ass good. And I'm like, shit, man, how am I going to do this? But I'm being called to tell my stories. And I want to give you a little background before I jump into the first story of, of what I want to share with you about when all this craziness started happening to me. When I first started working as a psychic medium, I don't really recall how it happened, but production companies, I was living in LA and production companies found out about me. And for a good while there, I was being pitched to television networks. And I was always sharing the stories about, you know, getting locked in rooms and the dead coming to me and, you know, shaking my bed and the ex-boyfriend who was passed, who took off my bra. That's a whole story that you're going to hear about. And I got burnt out by telling them. And recently, my community, I do a lot of Facebook Lives in Membership for Your Soul, Soul Finder Academy. Those are my um, programs that I have, as well as my Facebook business page. And my community is always telling me how they love my stories. They find them entertaining, and they learn something from them. And I really love telling people, teaching people through story. So I've been feeling this need to get these stories out there again and to have a different platform to share this experience and to hopefully teach people something because I'm constantly in evolution and I'm constantly learning myself and I just want to share that with other people. I'm always bringing my lessons into my communities so now I want to bring it out into a bigger platform. We'll see how big this platform gets but that's what I want to do. So I want to tell you about a period of my life when this started opening up and the craziness and I think you'll find it fun. I hope. So I want to take you back to a moment where I was sitting in this emergency room and it was an empty emergency room. Like, when does that happen? And my friend was sitting next to me, completely annoyed that I called her out of her date, but I couldn't drive the car because I had a big gash in my head and blood coming down my face. And I went in to see the doctor and he was like, how did you do this? And I told him I walked into a door. And that's when it struck me, all the friggin' doors, because... Before this, in New York, I was getting locked in, I got locked in a room. And then in LA, I was getting locked in rooms constantly. And then now I walked into a door. And when he told me he gave me seven stitches in my head, there was a significance with that number. Numbers have always shown up in my life, have always been been repetitive. And I didn't know exactly then what seven means, but I can tell you now that seven means your psychic ability is opening up, your mediumship ability is opening up. And I knew something was up. Something was like, there's something going on at these doors. I have to find out. So I went to see a psychic. And she told me the dead were trying to reach me. And it's definitely not what you want to hear when you go see a psychic. You're like, ooh, when am I going to meet that guy? And how's my career going to be? And she's like, the dead want to reach you. you got to go see a medium. So I found a medium, and I went to see her. And she came into the room. She knew nothing about me. And she looked at me, and she said, you're a medium. And the floodgates opened up. Like every Tom, every dead Tom, Dick, and Harry came to my house. And I was not liking it. It was not fun for me. It scared the crap out of me. When I hear mediums say, oh yeah, I didn't mind. I was never afraid. I was the medium that always slept with the nightlight on. I was petrified. I didn't like my bed being shook. I didn't like feeling the energy. When spirits come in, they will stand really close to you, especially on your back. And I was not comfortable with it. And I had to learn how to use these gifts because I was feeling like I was a little nuts. So I'm going to, I'm taking you into the middle of the story and I want to start where they started showing up. But before I do that, I want to just like really tell you that I truly believe that everybody is gifted. And I really believe that you can develop your gifts at any moment in your life and all the answers that we're seeking, they really are sitting in the seat of our soul. And I like to believe that I give tools and techniques, and a lot of people do, to navigate the confusion that we experience to get to the answers that are inside your soul. And I know that those dreams in your heart are meant to be lived. You're not to suffer. It could feel like it though. I mean, I I know I am not a stranger to suffering. So for a long time, I didn't believe that. And then when I started leaning into it and believing in it and believing that 
my guides were there for me to show me the way and and I believe in God I don't really care what anybody believes in but that's my thing um when God was in here to like punish me he actually the, these gifts in my heart were given to me and I was meant to live this life I got so much more excited about living so you're going to learn as we move on in this podcast how to tap into that space inside of you so that you can start living the life that's in your heart. And I got to tell you something my guides taught me. It's so much bigger than you can even imagine. I remember saying to my guides, my, telling them my dreams, and they're like, you're dreaming with brackets on. I'm like, what are you talking about? These dreams are huge. And they're like, no, you're dreaming from your past experience. You're dreaming from brackets on your dreams. We have something bigger for you. So let me share my stories with you and let me share the things that happened and let's take the brackets off your dreams and let's get you living a life that you're really plugged into and really excited to live. And when you have the moments that are not exciting and not fun, you understand them as character building moments. So I want to tell you about the first time spirit started showing up to me, but I didn't know that. It was, I was living in New York City, I was in Chelsea, and the kids who did the killings in Columbine started showing up to me. So I was already in therapy for PTSD, and I, was, I don't watch the news, but for some reason when that happened, I was watching the news a lot. I like, couldn't drag myself away from it. it. It was so shocking to me that this happened. And I was laying in bed, ready to go to sleep, when the two kids that did the actual killing were at the end of my bed. And I didn't understand it. I figured it was a figment of my imagination. I didn't understand it. And I was like, what is going on? You know, why am I seeing this? And I figured it was because I was afraid. And you're gonna hear me teach you that using your imagination is one of the best ways to communicate with your guides and with spirits, if that's what you wanna do. Many teachers in the course of my journey of studying would tell me not to, you know, they would say, don't use your imagination. Or some people would be so afraid, how do I know if it's my imagination or not? And they would be like, well, don't use that. I'm gonna tell you, use your imagination because that's where your guidance is. I'm gonna tell you to get out of that box. So there they were at the end of my bed, and some people asked me, how did you know it was them? And I just knew it. I just knew it was them. And if I recall, what was happening for me in that moment with them was I was feeling them. And they were feeling sorry for what they did. And there was more information they gave me, but I don't remember it now. I just remember being so frightened. And I couldn't go and turn on the light because they were standing near the light switch. So I prayed and prayed and prayed until they went away. Now, before I continue to tell you more, I wanna go back a little bit more. I had a feeling at this point I was psychic because I had known things before they'd happened. I had dreams, which is called, it's called precognitive dreaming when you have dreams that come true. I was already playing with tarot cards And the other thing that was happening to me is I started hearing whispering outside my right ear. I'll never forget, I was living in Chelsea and there was a a kind of a bridge from 24th Street to 23rd Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. And I was walking over that passageway and I heard this little whispering right by my right ear. And I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it was two people just whispering. And I remember telling my boyfriend at the time that the angels were talking to me. And I wasn't studying about angels. This is back in like, I don't even remember, early 90s. There was no internet. There wasn't all this angel readings. There wasn't all that stuff happening. Or we didn't know about it as much as we do today. And I just knew, I didn't even know what guides were, but I grew up Catholic. And I just like, I'm like, oh, that's my angels. They're, They're trying to talk to me. When I was younger, I had experiences. But you don't recognize that they're psychic experiences, especially if you grew up with people that told you it was your imagination or, you know, you're making it up. But when I was little, I used to be so scared because I had so many crazy experiences as a kid. And my mother would give me these scapulars and they're um, cloth 
little cloth things in plastic and they usually have a saint on them. And I would sleep with them under my pillow because I couldn't sleep. I was so afraid. And to this day, I sleep with prayer cards under my bed, but I'm not afraid. It's just a habit that I have that I enjoy. It makes me feel good. It's an ending night ritual. So when I was younger, I had all these experiences, which I'm going to share with you later on. And I was so afraid that I created this little angel and I would put her by the side of my bed. And I just would, it would make me feel safe. It would make me feel like I was okay. But again, back then, when I was doing all of this stuff, I, it, well, nobody was telling me to do that. My mother, of course, was religious and spiritual, and she was handing me scapulas and saint cards and having me pray. But I, I wasn't being told that, like, I had these gifts. Nobody, even though it runs in my family, nobody made the connection. There was also so much chaos going on in my life. We were Italian. Superstitions were normal. My mother was constantly doing novenas and believing in miracles. So I was surrounded by this stuff. But for me, I was just told, you're overactive, you're overdramatic, you're too sensitive, you blah, 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 blah. How many of those, how many of you have had that story? Like, it, it's just amazing to me. And you, you may not recognize this, that you had these experiences when you were younger until you realize it later on. Like, I didn't realize all these stories were my guides, were my psychic abilities until I really came into my psychic abilities. So I grew up with this stuff. I grew up with novenas. I grew up with the sense of miracles. I grew up with angels. And that always played the background in my life that was always part of me. So here I am living in Chelsea and going through a lot of traumatic experiences, my boyfriend moved out, and then 9-11 happened. And it was horrible, absolutely horrible. And I knew I needed to get out of New York City. And I want to take you back to that morning of 9-11 because something happened then that triggered my gifts even more. I was walking my dog, Emmy, I had a little dachshund, and this is before we knew anything happened, and I was in Chelsea at the time, and all of a sudden, I, emergency vehicles were heading downtown at like record-breaking speeds, and cops on foot were running, and you could feel the energy in the air was just so palpable, and you could feel that something was wrong, and this cab driver pulled up to a phone booth, because in those days, it wasn't even cell phones. And he made a call and it was kind of like almost like time stood still. And he got off the call and I went, what's going on? And he said a plane went into the uh, World Trade Center. And I'll never forget, I looked to the left of me and there was this gardener gardening at one of the apartment complexes. And he had a shovel in his hand and he just looked at me and I started crying. And we both, I could tell by his energy. I mean, this is before I knew how much you could, I could read people. And I could tell we both had this moment where this is bad. Something bad is happening. So I went upstairs and I turned on the TV and I called my best friend, uh, Rita, who was a New York City lieutenant. And I was like, I got to get to Brooklyn. How am I going to get to Brooklyn? I, I was working at my father's office at the time. Um, and she's like, Marilyn, you're not going anywhere. And that's when the second plane hit. And I sat there in horror, watching the towers burn and crumble to the ground. And that day, as slow as it moved, was like time stood still, but was also blurring. And I lived in this back apartment in Chelsea. So if I stuck my head out the window, all I saw was the backyard. So I kept going downstairs because I just felt so lost. Kept going downstairs and I'd open the front door of the apartment building and I'd just be watching all these people walk by me like zombies with soot all over their face and their clothing. And then I'd go upstairs and I'd call someone because we were trying to find our, my family and like I, I'd get in touch with my, my brother. My brother from California got in touch with me. We couldn't find my mother. We didn't know where she was. Um, I got in touch with my father. He didn't, it would, like, so we were making sure everybody was safe. And then my brother called me, who was a police officer, a police lieutenant, and, and he was in police plaza, and they had to move him out of police plaza. 
and I'll never forget our conversation because he's not a very sentimental person, but they were scared. They were afraid that a plane was then going to go into police plaza. This is when more planes were starting to come down. And I could hear the tears in his throat as we talked and just shared sentiments and pretty much hug, 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 hugged each other over the phone. And then I went back downstairs and I went to a liquor store because that's what I was going to friggin' do, buy some wine. And I'm standing in line because I wasn't the only one with this friggin' idea. With wine in my hand, more than one bottle, that's for sure. And I felt something on my neck. And I grabbed it and opened up my palm and it was this bee. And it just was sitting there stunned. And this is like even before all this stuff was going on with bees, right? Now we'd be like, well, these poor bees. And I didn't realize it then how important bee symbolism is. And bees are about impossible dreams coming true. And they're about creativity. And 9-11 for many people, and I can't talk about other people's experiences. I can only share my own. This was a catapulting moment for me because this changed everything in my life. But I didn't know that as that bee was sitting in my hand. So I went and bought the wine and I went back up to my house and I just moved through that day. I think that night I got completely trashed at a bar, um, came home and the guy downstairs who owned the laundromat brought me coffee. I was just a mess, a complete mess. So during those couple of days in Manhattan, everywhere we went, we would sometimes be hearing that there was a bomb scare and we'd have to run home. I'd run home. Uh, outside my apartment, I could see the, um, the Empire State Building and it, you just couldn't take your eyes off it because you didn't know if that was going to be standing there. The, I believe the second day, I went down to the towers with my boyfriend at the time and um, these patriotic these, this group of singers were singing patriotic songs and everybody was working their way up to the barrier to see what was left of the towers. So there was like a crowd of people, patriotic songs, and we're working our way up there. We get to the barrier and all you see is that pretty much what everybody saw, that piece of metal sticking out of the ground. Or the news reports were about where the smoke was going to be that day. A block away from my house was the triage, you know, so I tried to volunteer. There's so many stories that happened. But one of the big, and the other thing that happened too was walking around town and seeing all the missing photos. Have you seen this person? Have you seen that person? Um, So surrounded in this like craziness in some way. And I would be in my apartment, in the back apartment again, and I would be trying to go to sleep. And I kept hearing the sirens. And because we didn't know what was going on, I would run to the living room window and I would open up the window and it would be silent. And then I'd go back to bed and I couldn't open the window in my bedroom. And this is going to be important for later on because there was a big air conditioning conditioning unit in it. And I'd hear the sirens again. And I'd run out into the living room, open the window and silence. And I went back to bed. And the sirens went off again. And I run out to the window again and I open it up and silence. And that's when it struck me. The sirens were in my head. Now, what I didn't realize now, back then I thought, I I was conscious enough to know, I must be hearing the sirens all day long, that now they're just the symphony in my head. But what I can tell you now is that's a form of clairaudience, clairhearing. And sirens actually have a, a really big symbolic Uh, message for me. So I finally went back to bed, recognizing that the sirens are in my head, trying to go to sleep. And then what appears at the end of my bed, but the pilots that were flying the planes. And they had blood dripping down their face, and they were just standing there stunned. Now, whether they really had blood or not, it, it was for me to understand that they weren't alive, that, that that's who they were. And all I could feel was their sense of responsibility. And again, I didn't understand what was going on because I figured, okay, I have PTSD. 
and I was in therapy at the time, and maybe this is just happening because of my own trauma in my lifetime. And this time around, as much as it scared the heck out of me, I was so frightened and so scared with everything, and I'm super sensitive, and I didn't understand anything about empathic ability, how you could... Pathic ability is when you pick up the energy of people's emotions, but it's not only the emotions. You can pick up the energy. I'm super sensitive to space. I can walk into a space, a building, and I can tell you what's going on in it or uh, what happened. I once, a friend of mine asked me to come look at her apartment before she moved in with her boyfriend. And I walked in and I went, there is just heartache all over this apartment. Everywhere I go, there is heartache. And she found out later from the landlord that the two couples that lived before there, before they rented it broke up in that apartment. And she also broke up in that apartment. I told her to clear it and she didn't. So I'm super sensitive to space. I'm super sensitive to people. And what people don't realize also is when deceased people come to visit you, they want you to feel what they're feeling. And that's a way of communication. So I was feeling what they were feeling. And I couldn't tell where I ended and they began. And I didn't understand any of it. I still thought it was PTSD. I didn't know what was going on. And I remember going to therapy, I think it was the day after, and talking to my therapist about it. And I wasn't, I was, was in therapy for years. I, at that point, I must've been in therapy for about 10 years already. And I was never put on medication. I was never uh, diagnosed as psychotic or anything. So I knew that that wasn't what was going on with me. Otherwise, I would have, this therapist knew me for years. She would have definitely diagnosed me with that. But it was because of the trauma that was going on in the city that she felt that it was just uh, engaging my PTSD. I had to get out of the city. I couldn't take it anymore. The, d- the day that I was volunteering at the triage, it, we felt useless. There was nothing we could do. And we were just running around trying to get water and saline solution and masks. People would be standing out in the Chelsea Piers, which is where it was, with signs or shouting, we need saline solution, we need water. And I gathered up with a couple of other people and we jumped into a white van with no windows. I mean, not the smartest thing to do. I didn't know the person. And we drove around to different restaurants trying to get gather materials can you donate something and we'd bring it back to chelsea and then um i remember standing outside of saint vincent's and um just while they stood out there with all the chairs with white because they figured they wouldn't have enough wheelchairs with white sheets over them but none of the people were arriving because unfortunately too many people perished and hearing they need sandwiches and then running to the store and trying to get sandwiches for them it was such a useless feeling And mixed in with my sensitivities, not understanding it, my empathic ability, my ability now to all of a sudden see spirits, but not knowing that's what's going on, I was losing it. And my um, therapist was like, you need to get out of the city. You need to get out of here. So luckily for me, nobody could leave the city and nobody could come in. And luckily for me, my father was a retired New York City uh, deputy inspector. And I was able to get him to get into the city to get me. And he came into the city and I gathered my dog and got into his car and I was really out of it. And I'll just remember, I just remember driving over the Brooklyn Bridge because he was taking to my mother's house so that we, my mother was fine. We found her. She was on her way to East Hampton and um, he took me to her apartment so that she could take me out to East Hampton And uh, I just remember driving over the Brooklyn Bridge and hearing that song that everybody heard in the arms of an angel. And I knew my life that I knew it was changed forever. But I didn't realize what that meant. I didn't realize that this was a gateway to the deepest parts of myself, to my spirituality, to my abilities. I didn't recognize on that bridge, my favorite bridge. I always like it to go to Manhattan because I don't really like going back to Brooklyn. I didn't realize on that bridge, in that darkness, listening to that song, how much I was being held, how much I was being guided, and how much 
my whole world was going to crack open. So in the next episode, I'm going to share with you how the spirit started locking me in rooms and what went on after that. So I do hope that you enjoyed that story. I do hope that you learned a few things. I highlighted the number seven. When you see repetitive numbers, our spirit guides are constantly communicating to us through symbols. And I teach in my communities about the symbolic language of your soul. And I would love to throw everything into this one episode. Um, but I think that that probably would not be a good idea for you or for me. So instead, I want to leave you with this, that the number seven, when you see it, if you choose, if you like my meaning of it, it usually means your psychic ability is opening. And there's definitely significance when you see, um, right now I'm seeing 122 as I'm recording this, which is a very significant number. That's new beginnings into partnerships, into new foundation. It adds up to a five, transformation, transitions, partnership with self. There's a lot that goes on with that. So uh, I highlighted the number seven for you and also the B symbolism. They're constantly talking to us in symbols. The universe, source, God, whatever you believe, like I, I honestly don't care what people believe. It's whatever works for you. None of us really understand why we're here. We all, we all find a belief system that works for us and that belief system changes and evolves and shifts so that we can find comfortable, a comfortability with being here and we can evolve into what people want to believe is purpose. I believe it's soul alignment. So that was another thing I shared with you. And the other thing was a clairaudient message. Um, a lot of times we wake up with songs in our heads or we wake up with um, sounds. Sounds can have a big thing. And I'm going to I'm gonna share with you how the clairaudient messages got even more insane. And uh, pay attention to that. If you wake up with a song in your head before you listen to the next episode, go look at the lyrics. Because those are your guides communicating with you, teaching you something telling you telling you something that you need to know helping you to answer your questions it doesn't always give you the full on solution but it gives you the next step so until next time thank you so much for listening and you can find me at whocanitbenow.com um you can find this podcast there And you can also find me on wherever you listen to podcasts, Who Can It Be Now? And I look forward to sharing with you the next part of this journey. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this, please subscribe and share and rate this podcast. Have an incredible day or evening whenever you're listening to this. Thank you.